All right, the truth about the will of God. So what is God's will for your life? Now that's a big question, isn't it? And when I ask that question, a lot of people think about what house and what spouse and what job and what future and what decisions to make in order to get right and stay right with God. And over the years, if you've grown up in church and been in Christian circles, maybe you've heard the idea that you need to first find the will of God. It's very difficult to find in some cases, people might think. And then after you've found the will of God, then it's your job to stay in the will of God. So think about that for a minute. What a, what a challenge it would be to understand the mind of the Lord, find what he wanted for you to do in terms of house and spouse and job and every decision right down to the cereal that you eat in the morning in order to stay right with God, stay in his will, get there, get in his will, and then stay in it. This is the sort of thing that many of us have grown up with, and, well, error puts you in bondage, and the truth sets you free. So let's talk about that for a minute. You know, when I was growing up, I had the impression that uh, God's will was like a target. I've shared this with some of you in the past. God's will was like a target, and, well, your job was to get into the bullseye of that target. Now, if, if you didn't hit God's perfect will, See, God's perfect will is the bullseye of that target. And if you didn't hit God's perfect will, then you fell into that second ring, which was God's permissive will. And then if you missed that one, then, well, maybe you were in, I don't know, uh, the outer ring of darkness or something. You had missed God's perfect will and you had missed God's permissive will, and so now who knows what would become of you. Or maybe you thought of God's will as a series of doors. God is opening and shutting doors, and if you walk through the wrong door, then who knows how that limits you for the rest of your life, and if there will be any more doors for you to walk through. So these sort of mentalities can be crippling, can be paralyzing for people when they don't recognize what God's will is really all about and how liberating the truth can be. So we start with this very simple question, what is God's will for your life? And I hope you'll enjoy the journey with me. It's a scriptural journey to discover the will of God. And I don't think you'll dis be disappointed because, as I said, the truth will always, always set us free. All right, well, we begin with a very simple statement, and that is, God's will is salvation. Now, I'm bringing you God's will progressively using Scripture to show that God's will is not about, oh, you better pick this house, or you better pick this spouse, uh, or you better pick this job, or else. See, that's crippling and paralyzing, but what we're going to see is that God's will is actually obvious and clear and liberating, and part of that obvious will of God is that God's will is salvation. He loves humanity. He loves the world. He wants to save any and every one of us who will call upon his name. We read in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, Peter writes and he says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So this is part of God's will. Not wishing for any to, to, to perish, to die, to do without salvation, to reject the gospel, but instead for all to come to this decision of repentance. Now, what does that say for those who have said, well, God only died for some people. Jesus only gave his life for some people. God only sent his son to hang on a cross for the elected people, those who were chosen ahead of time. And well, the hell with the rest of you, literally, because God hasn't picked you. Well, you can see that from this passage alone, uh, that whole idea is blown to smithereens, isn't it? Not wishing for any, anyone to perish. But for how many? 
for all to come to repentance. Who does God want to save? All. Does that mean that everyone's saved? No, of course not. God's a gentleman and he's not going to force himself on people that don't want him. But his desire, his heart, his will is that anyone and everyone come to a decision of repentance, turning away from unbelief and turning toward belief in Jesus Christ. That's 2 Peter 3.9. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 2 says something very similar to what we just read in Peter's epistle. It says, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Again, we're seeing this phrase, all. What is God's will? What is God's heart? What is God's desire? That all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So, does this sound mysterious to you? Does this sound far off to you? Does this sound difficult to uh, respond to? Is it hard to find God's will and then stay in it? Well, thus far... God wants to save people. That's pretty plain and obvious and clear and simple and straightforward. God's will is not really some sort of challenging mystery that is too hard to solve or find. Now, next, an extension of this truth that God's will is salvation. Well, God's will is salvation for the Gentiles and the Jews. Now, I bring this up because... This was a newsflash. As I have often shared with this group, this was a newsflash that God would save Gentiles. God was in the business of saving Jews. God was in the business of protecting Israel. If you had your Club Israel membership card, then you were one lucky person because Yahweh was on your side. And many times he was sending the Israelites out to uh, demolish other armies. They were not protected by God. But Israel was. So the idea that God would save Israel, the idea that God would extend this gospel message to Jews was a no-brainer. It was no surprise. It was obvious. That's why Peter, James, and John were doing what they were doing in the heart of Jerusalem, in the heart of Israel, spreading the news about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of any Jew who would come to believe in him. But wait a minute, what about Brother Paul over there? Are you kidding me? He's been told to go talk to those Romans. He's been told to go talk to those Ephesians. He's been told to talk to those dirty Gentiles because God is extending the gospel to them. Yes, in fact, we find that this is part of God's will. Very specifically, not just to save people, not just to save humans, but to save Gentiles specifically, not only the Jewish people. So we see this in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, God made known to us the mystery of his will. So is God's will a mystery? Yes, but he made it known to us. It's obvious now, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, here it comes, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. So what is God's will? It was a mystery. It was a secret. It was kept hidden. But now it has been revealed. It is plain and obvious today that God's will is the summing up of all things in Christ. Not just heavenly things like the angels and the saints in heaven, but things on the earth like Jews and Gentiles coming together as one new man, the new creation in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ becomes the unifier. He allows us to merge in our diversity to become one in Him, being the body of Jesus Christ on planet earth. This is God's will. Here you could say God's will is unity. God's will is the idea that we come together under His name and in Him as one, united with Him and united with each other. We belong to one another in Jesus Christ. And our lineage, our heritage, our bloodline, our race, our past, our background, 
None of that matters because Jesus has unified us. And that was God's plan. That was God's mysterious plan, his mysterious will that has now been revealed. All right, so far, are you paralyzed? (laughs) So far, are you wondering what God's will is? So far, have you seen that you need to make a desperate attempt to search for his will and get in it and then stay in it? Or you might miss it? Certainly not. Maybe you heard that in the Bible belt, but you won't hear that in the Bible. Maybe you heard that in Christian circles, but you won't hear it from Christ. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well, Ephesians goes on, the Apostle Paul talking to these Ephesian Christians who are Gentiles. He says, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. So again, both in Ephesians 1 and in Ephesians 3, Paul is telling us that God's will is that the Gentiles be fellow heirs. It was a mystery. It was not made known to other generations. But blessed are we, we live in a generation where this is plain and obvious, it's been made known to us that we Gentiles, most of us in this room and out there watching on the web, most of us are Gentiles. And so how much can we then give thanks that this is God's will? God's will is that people like us get to be included in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is not being nebulous. He is being specific. Notice it says, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. All right, well, next we're going to see there are choices that we make, but it's interesting, those choices are not really about what house and what spouse and what car and what job or else you've missed it. Instead, these choices are mainly about attitudes. In other words, God's will is that we exude certain attitudes. God's will is that we take on certain mindsets that fit with who we are and fit with who Christ is living in us. Here we go. God's will relates to attitudes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If there's no other theme verse for this entire message, let this be it. Are you wondering what God's will is for your life? Well, here's God's will for your life. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. What does that mean? Well, rejoice is an attitude of, wow, amazing, incredible, awesome, The gospel makes me go, wow, and I say thank you. Pray, pray without ceasing is another attitude. Father, I need you. In every moment, I'm connected to you. I am plugged into you. You are connected to me. You live in me, and I live in you. Thank you for the life of your spirit living in me. And even when I don't know how to pray, you know how to pray for me. And so living from Christ not living for Christ. Many people talk about living for Christ. Here, we're talking about an attitude of living from Christ, letting Christ be our everything, letting Christ be our source, praying to the Father, and it says without ceasing. Does that mean you should have a car wreck in all of your holiness? Does that mean that you should walk across the street with your head buried in prayer Uh, Because of all your holiness and all of your commitment to prayer. No, the idea here, pray without ceasing, doesn't mean you have to neurotically come up with words for God the Father every second of your existence. But instead, he is saying throughout your life, throughout your journey here on planet Earth, make it a habit, make it a normal everyday activity to talk to Dad. Present your requests to him. Talk to him about your struggles. Let him be your counselor. Let him be your comforter. Don't hold back. 
Let him see your tears. Express who you are to him. Don't be afraid of him. Approach him with boldness and confidence. Know that he is for you. Know that he'll never leave you. Know that he'll never forsake you. Know that he wants to hear from you. In other words, take advantage of this intimate connection that you have with him because this is God's will for you. And then lastly, it says give thanks. That means when things stink on planet earth, there's got to be something there that I'm thankful for. And I've said it many times, planet earth comes at us and it's ugly. I don't want to say, thank you, Lord, that my dog died. Thank you, Lord, that I stubbed my toe. But instead, what I can say is, thank you, Lord, that you live in me no matter what. Thank you that you'll never leave me, even if I'm impoverished, even if I'm alone, even if uh, all the loved ones in my life die and disappear, even if people let me down, even if people misunderstand me and reject me, you will never leave me. And for that, I give thanks in all things. And so it's not martyrdom. It's not a plastic smile. It's not a fake grin. It's not that sort of churchy face. How you doing, bro? Oh, I'm great. I'm great. Everyone's died. I'm all alone. My dog died and I stubbed my toe, but I'm great. It's not that. It's not that fake churchy face that we might be tempted to put on. Instead, it's being real, letting our requests be made known to others, to God, to trusted friends, and also finding that truth that we can give thanks for in the moment, that rock-solid truth that is a foundation no matter what the storm is. So what are we seeing here? God's will is not you got to choose this spouse, you got to choose this house, you got to choose this job or else. No, God's will is attitudes that are attitudes of Christ Jesus being worked in and through us in an everyday way. All right, well, next we see it's not only about attitudes, but it's also about actions. God's will relates to actions. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Paul is, goes on there and he talks about handling your body as a vessel, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, and not uh, considering the body to be used for flippant things, for evil things. And so to possess your body in honor and in respect of the fact that you carry the Lord Jesus Christ inside of you. You'll notice the word sanctification, and I've talked about this. Remember that you, your identity, who you are, you've been sanctified. That just means set apart. That means set apart for a purpose. So that's been done. You have a purpose. You are God's child. You belong to him. You are holy, blameless, and sanctified. Hebrews 10 verse 10 tells us that we have been sanctified. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us that we have been sanctified. So we as people have been sanctified. But what is in focus here is our behavior. Is all of our behavior, all of our attitudes and actions, have they been set apart? Certainly not. There are daily choices, aren't there? So this is one of those daily choices. Do I reserve my body for God? Do I set apart this temple for him? Or do I allow it to be used by sin for other purposes altogether? And the whole point is, don't waste away time and energy chasing after sin and letting your body be abused by sin. Instead, wake up every day and offer yourself to God as someone who is alive to him and offer your body to him as something that is holy and acceptable to him. This is our reasonable act of worship. People want to know what worship is. How do I worship? How do I have an attitude of worship? How can I remain in worship all week? And many of us have associated worship with music. But I like to remind people that, look, 1% of our worship might involve music, but 99% of our worship is any step taken in dependency on the Lord Jesus Christ who lives in us. So as you offer yourself being alive to God, and as you offer your body as something that is holy and acceptable to Him, this is your reasonable 
act of worship. This is a way to worship God. Just saying, God, here's my body. Take it today. I do not want to offer it to sin. I want to offer it to you. It just makes all the sense in the world, given who I am, holy and sanctified, for me to then sanctify my body by offering it to you for your purposes today. Hebrews 13 goes on to talk about how God's will is attitudes and actions. Now the God of peace, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will. You'll notice that good things, good works, the fruit of the Spirit is God's will. And he says, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Now I love this because the pressure is off. This is, this is the writer of Hebrews and his prayer. May the God, by the way, the God of peace the God who is at peace with you, the God who loves you, the God who likes you, the God who is united with you, may he equip you, how? Through the knowledge of him. You're equipped down here. You're equipped in your heart. You have everything you need for life and godliness, but through the renewing of the mind and through the equipping that goes on up here as I come to the knowledge of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and I am strengthened by grace well, then I'm equipped in everything that is good. Well, what's good? Well, we know that on God's heart, things like love and patience and gentleness and kindness, these are what God calls good because only God is good. Remember, they came to Jesus talking about this word good, and he reprimanded them and said, hey, only God is good. Who are you calling good unless you're calling me God? And that was the whole point he was making. He was and is God. But my point today is that there is no good apart from God. There is no great apart from grace. There is nothing of value apart from what Christ is working in us. And so as we see that God is working in us, the pressure is off. See, are you trying to accumulate enough good works today to feel great about you? Or are you walking in the works that God has prepared in advance so that you can just wake up and walk in them? I think of it like bowling pins. God is setting up these good works. He wakes you up in the morning and he says, hey, here's an opportunity to walk right into these things that I have set up for you one by one. I have rigged it. It is your destiny you are designed for good works, and here's 17 opportunities to love on somebody, to say a kind word to somebody, to encourage someone, to console someone, to comfort someone, whatever it might be. But I have set the stage for you to be you. So you be you, and you let Christ live in and through you. God is working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Who's doing the work there? God. God is doing the work. He is working where? In you. Why? So that he can see what is pleasing in his sight. So the pressure is off. God is initiating. God is completing. And then God is happy with what he produced. It's much like creation, isn't it? God saw that it was good. He created the world and then he saw that it was good. Same thing with the Christian life. He is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And then he turns and he looks at what he's done in and through you. And he says, yeah, that's good. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2. It's, uh, it's talking about government authorities here, kings, human institutions. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Here the apostle Peter has been talking about what it means to suffer and how stupid and foolish it is to suffer for wrong reasons. Why bring that on yourself? Why suffer for a crime? Why suffer for a, a choice that goes against the rulers and authorities and laws of the land and then spend the rest of your days in a prison cell because you deserve it? So Peter is saying that is foolish, but he's also saying if you have to suffer as a Christian, then so be it. If you suffer for your faith, if you suffer for what you believe about Jesus, then fine, that's an honor, so be it, let it be. But how foolish it is to waste your time 
suffering as an evildoer. And so he reveals to us here that God's will is that we be sensible. That God's will is that we walk in the wisdom of the Lord. That God's will is that we not waste time and energy doing, doing foolish stuff like people who don't know the Lord. Ephesians 5 says something very similar. Again, the Apostle Paul here is, is writing and he says, Therefore, be careful how you walk. What does walk refer to? Behavior. Not as unwise men, but as wise Making the most of your time, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, I just want you to pause for a minute, not only for dramatic emphasis on what we've just read, but also to get the big picture again. Remember what you might have grown up with. Did you grow up with, you got to find God's will and it's tough and you got to listen for God's will, but maybe there's a bunch of sin plugging your ears and you can't hear God because of all the sin in your life. But once you get rid of the sin in your life, then you'll be able to hear his will. Then you'll be able to get in his will. Then you'll be able to stay in his will and then you'll be okay with God. Now, have we seen any of that? I mean, here we are. We've looked at a ton of scripture already, and we haven't seen any of that funny business. That is bondage, and the truth will set you free. What we have seen is God's will is salvation. God loves Gentiles and not just Jews. God cares about our attitudes in general, love and patience and kindness toward others. God cares about our actions, the way we treat people, whether we carry our body in honor or dishonor. Now, that's just scriptural, biblical, spiritual common sense, isn't it? That's not rocket science. That's not hard to understand. That's not about what cereal to eat or what job to take or else you're out. You're out of the will of God. So what has happened is that many in the church have been paralyzed by error when this simple truth will set us free. God's will is big. God's will is Jesus Christ in you. God's will is Jesus Christ expressed through you. So, don't be foolish. Make the most of your time. Understand what God's will really is. All right, well, next I want to point out that God's will is not paralyzing. Now, I just described to you what that paralysis of analysis looks like, didn't I? Many of us grew up in that paralysis. We were kept back by it, held down by it, or maybe we thought we would grow up and choose all the right things and then have this nice, warm Italian feeling inside, you know, like after a great bowl of pasta or something. We would feel it. We would know it when we were in God's will and staying there through our choices. But then, for others of us, we were not able to generate that warm Italian feeling inside. And so we were left wondering, did I miss the will of God? Did I have the will of God? Was I in it? But then I fell out of it. And we were looking at God's will as very specific life choices. And well, it tripped us up. That whole idea tripped us up. And we ended up like a deer in the headlights not knowing whether we were okay. Well, some great news. Even as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're looking at the Apostle Paul's attitude toward marriage, toward the will of God concerning finding a spouse. Look at what he says in the ninth chapter. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife? even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. In other words, Paul's point is, step off. Quit judging me. Don't I have a right to take along a wife if I want to? Don't the other apostles have a right to do this and this and this? There is tons of freedom here. But now wait a minute. What did Paul choose concerning a wife? Concerning marriage, what do we know that Paul selected for himself? Well, he ultimately chose to remain single. Remember that he likely reasoned something like this. Hey, I may not come home one night. I've already been stoned and walked away from it. I've already been challenged and opposed by so many enemies, so many opponents who hate me. 
I've watched as my fellow Christians have been dragged from their homes and tortured and killed. So would it be wise for me, the apostle to the Gentiles, traveling all the time from city to city to be connected with a wife? Would that be loving to her? Would that be kind to her? So in the midst of all this freedom to marry any believing woman, well, I choose singlehood. I choose singleness because it makes the most sense to me. What does that tell you about one of life's major decisions, marriage, who to marry, whether to get married or not? In this instance, Paul sees an atmosphere of liberty and a right, and yet he did not exercise that right. This communicates to us freedom. The pressure's off. It's not about finding the right house and the right spouse and the right, right job or you're out of God's will. This was certainly not Paul's view. Now, what about Romans chapter 1? Here, I love this passage. This is maybe my favorite passage for decision making. Sure, if any man lacks wisdom, let him, let him ask a God. But check out Paul here. He says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far. Huh, that's interesting. So that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. So Paul, come on, man. You, the apostle to the Gentiles, the author of many letters in the New Testament, are you telling me you packed your suitcase for Rome many times? You planned to go to Rome many times. But you were prevented? Um, hello, didn't you have like a pipeline to God's will? Didn't you have like a perfect channel where you could just tune in to what the God of the universe wanted you to do and where he wanted you to be next? And didn't you know your very next steps? Well, apparently not. Apparently Paul operated like a lot of us. He operated not knowing what tomorrow would bring not knowing whether he would be prevented from something. And so he made plans and he packed his suitcase. He folded up his tunics and he put them in that suitcase and he zipped it up and he was carrying it and he was almost out the door a number of times. And for whatever reasons, he was prevented. Now I give you that symbolism to show you that you're not alone if you need to make decisions without a feeling. You're not alone if you need to make choices without a knowing of what tomorrow brings. Look, we all walk by faith. And so the will of God is not about where to live and what job to take and who to marry. And if you choose these things, you'll be okay. And if you miss these things, you will not, not be okay. You see, your okayness does not come from your daily decisions. And we're going to talk about that. So let me issue a warning. I want to read this slowly. I want to read it maybe twice because I find it's a pretty common problem. Warning, don't let a frantic search for getting in God's will and staying in God's will become a works righteousness for you. Now let me say that again. Let me read it again as I said I would. Don't let a frantic search for getting in God's will and then staying in God's will, don't let that become a works righteousness for you. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me just say I've lived it, I've experienced it, and I've seen it in other people, and we are so tempted to make our choices connect to our rightness before God. We are so tempted to believe that we are on a path that is destiny, but somehow we might mess up the destiny, we might mess up the future, we might mess up God's will, we might mess up and miss it, and then be in will number two, or will number three, or will number four, and eventually we are in a lesser experience of the Christian life, and in a lesser experience of relationship with God, and we've got everything ranked and charted, and we go back to 1997 and 1982, and we believe that those choices that we made derailed us, shipwrecked us for all time, and now we are messed up having missed it. 
And what I'm saying is that is a worldly view of destiny and future prediction. And it is not the gospel. And it is not the liberating truth that will set you free. So, in summation here, what am I saying about this warning? I'm saying, remember, you are righteous by new birth, not by daily choices. Now, I'm going to say this one twice. You are righteous, right with God, right standing, right status, right before your Father. You are right by your new birth, not by your daily choices. It is not about the cereal. It is not about the house and spouse. Now, don't get me wrong. Let's ask for wisdom. God may be advising you, if you buy that house, the mortgage is much higher. Be careful. God may be advising you, if you marry that person that is a young believer, they're in a different stage of life than you, heed that warning. Just know that. They may be warning you, you guys have very different beliefs. If you come together, one of you wants three kids, one of you wants no kids. So consider this, consider these issues, have wisdom, use godly common sense, but it is not about having to find the right choice in order to get right and stay right with God. Do you see that? That your rightness is by new birth, not by daily choices. All right, well, what did we see today? I hope you've seen the truth that will set you free. What is God's will? First, we saw that God's will is salvation for anyone. Very simple. Jesus in you. Second, we saw that God's will relates to attitudes and actions. Very simple. Jesus through you. Next, we saw that God's will is not paralyzing. It's not about these exact choices or you'll miss it. Instead, God's will is Jesus Christ in you. And Jesus Christ expressed through you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your will. We thank you that your will is beautiful. That your will is liberating. That your will is a person. Jesus Christ living in us. We call that salvation. Jesus Christ in us. That your will is Jesus Christ through us. We call that attitudes and actions. Father, we thank you for the fruit of your spirit. We thank you for the good works that you've prepared in advance for us that we get to walk in. Father, some of us here watching online or in this room today, some of us have been paralyzed in the search for your will. And today, Father, we are liberated. We recognize the truth that sets us free, that your will is your son, Jesus Christ. We admit it. We agree to that. We recognize it. We fall at the feet of you and respect that. That your will is simple and plain and straightforward. Your will is Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.